Hello, everyone. Chris Martinson from Peak Prosperity here with David Stockman. Hi, David. Uh, Chris, great to be with you. I look forward to the conference. Absolutely. Well, I'm here to let everybody know that we are going to be delivering a special summit in New York City on Sunday, September 16th, 2018. That's from 10 a.m. in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. David, what kind of things are you going to be talking about and presenting? Well, my focus is going to be on the end of bubble of the bubble finance era, uh, driven by an extraordinary uh, central bank expansion that uh, was just off the charts of anything that had happened uh, previously in history or even had been contemplated. And, of course, that led to huge bubbles in all the financial markets of the world, a tremendous inflation of financial assets. All of that seemed to create the appearance of prosperity. I think it was fake. I think it was unsustainable. Mm -hmm. And now we have the Fed finally recognizing that it has to pivot to QT and move to shrink its balance sheet and normalize uh, you know, monetary policy and interest rates, and that's going to change everything as we go forward. Absolutely. And David, to that, I'm going to dovetail in. I'm going to be focusing on energy, specifically oil, which many more analysts are now coming around to my view saying, hey, it could go to 100, maybe 200 a barrel based on structural investment shortfalls that already happened. So I'm going to be discussing that and what that will mean to this late stage credit cycle you're talking about in this world of inflated asset bubbles as well. I have some economic data I like. I'd love to get your views on that as we riff on that and the environment too. So I think we have to bring the the ecological world in. And of course, you, the audience, will have the chance to both listen to the timely, actionable information of David Stockman and myself, as Adam Taggart's going to be there as well. Ask all three of us any questions you may have for more information and to register. Please go to peakprosperity.com slash NYC. Again, that's peakprosperity.com slash NYC. See you there. Welcome to the Peak Prosperity Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Taggart. This week, we welcome back Joel Salatin. Labeled by the Washington Post as the most famous farmer in America, Joel has spent his career advocating for sustainable farming practices and pioneering models that show how food can be grown and raised in ways that are regenerative to our topsoils, are more humane to livestock, produce much healthier, tastier food, and contribute profitably to the local economy. Now, who wouldn't want that? Well, the government and big ag, for starters. Joel refers to himself as a lunatic farmer because so many of the changes he thinks our food system needs are either illegal under current law or mightily resisted by the deep-pocketed corporations controlling production and distribution. But that doesn't stop him from his passion of inspiring others to take a better path. He co-owns and operates with his family Polyface Farm in Swope, Virginia. Featured in the New York Times bestseller Omnivore's Dilemma and award-winning documentary Food, Inc., The farm services more than 5,000 families, 50 restaurants, 10 retail outlets, a farmer's market with produce and pastured beef, poultry, as well as forestry products. On the farm, Joel and his staff pilot new practices, they mentor young farmers, they educate the public, and they produce an excellent set of workshops for those looking to truly get their hands dirty learning how to farm sustainably. It's been over a year since we've had Joel on the podcast, so we've asked him back to update us on what's new in sustainable agriculture, as well as which endeavors he's been most focused on. Joel, thanks so much for returning to talk with us. Thank thank you. It's my my pleasure, (laughs) yes. Well, thanks. Well, first, Joel, I just want to start on a personal note. You and I had a chance to spend a few days together two years back when uh, we brought you out to present at a farm that I was involved in here in Northern California. Um, there's an old saying, it says, uh, never meet your heroes because they rarely measure up to your romanticized version of them. And, you know, with all the interviews Chris and I have done over the years, it's been like hundreds at this point. Um, I've generally realized that advice to be true. You know, after you meet these folks that you've idolized from a distance, um, they kind of bring themselves down a few pegs usually because, you know, they're human. They've got foibles and idiosyncrasies and things that just don't map to your fantasized vision of them. But you, Joel, you are a rare exception. Um, I just enjoyed our time together so much. You're so passionate about your craft. You're so genuine in your enthusiasm to help educate others. And you know, I just love how you comport yourself with integrity in everything you do. You really are a hero who measures up to the legend. So I just wanted to recognize you for that. Oh, thank you. It's very, very gracious. <laughs> no worries. It's uh 
uh, it's definitely very deserved and earned on your part. So anyways, with the fanboy gushing out of the way, um, let's just kick things off with a high-level question. Um, as I said, it's been about a year since we've had you on the program. What's new and noteworthy in, in agriculture, sustainable or not, since we last talked? Like, uh, you know, what are the key things that have happened in the past year that have caught your attention that you think the general public should be more aware of? Yeah, I think I think certainly one is the is the breakdown of the organic certification program that uh, you know we um, the the official government government organic certification program in the U.S. Um, now is the only we're the only country in the world that certifies uh, soilless systems. You know the enabling le- legislation back whatever 25 years ago that Senator Patrick Leahy. Uh, put in the wording is is all about soil. I mean that was the, that was the crux of the of the whole certification program was to how are you handling the soil, and um, and now after these it's taken you know it's taken a couple decades but gradually that that um, you know that that standard has been compromised and compromised and compromised and adulterated until now. Um, yeah, here we are uh, certifying soil as uh, hydroponic hydroponic systems. No other country in the world, you know, recognizes that as a as an organic option. Mm-hmm. So once again, so once again, and I've I've, I've actually done a fair amount of actually uh, foreign travel in the last year. That's really that's really picking up. I've been in, you know, Australia, Spain, Austria, uh, England, uh, Netherlands twice. Um, uh, just different things, and um, and and here once again, here we are. Uh, we, I mean, we as Americans, you know, uh, are what we're known for around the world. Somebody asks, you know, what's what's American food culture? The first thing they say is you know, fast food, McDonald's. Uh, that that's not the best thing to bring to the world. And then the second, and 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 now here we are, uh, you know, pushing. We we brought we brought. Genetically modified organisms to the world. Now we're bringing nanotechnology to the world, and now you know we're bringing, uh, we're trying to force other countries to you know go with uh, hydroponic. So you know the the food scene uh, from America, the 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 techno food scene is you know is is not a good one, and uh, that has certainly you know that has certainly change things that that adulteration of the, of the label not not the least of which is the is all of the um, you know the organic grain coming out of Slovenia and Latvia through uh, Istanbul that that uh, gets stamped organic and then imported into the US and so what we have is is we have a we have a, a pretty significant breakdown in the credibility of organics and there are probably I don't know that I know of, right off the top of my head like half a dozen alternatives uh, uh, counterparts to the government organic certification that are not government programs they are they are a private you know like like AAA or you know underwriters laboratory they're they're private certification programs that are coming on in in response to the uh, adulteration of government organics so that that is certainly a a big change that that's happened um, or I should say a, I should say a tipping point change. It's been brewing for a long time, but I would say in the last year and a half, um, with the with the final votes in in Florida back in whenever it was uh, October, uh, the the divorce is pretty complete. Hmm. Okay, so just to make sure I'm following, it sounds like you're saying that the uh, the term organic uh, that we've used for several decades now, uh, has been getting more and more, let's say, diluted because uh, yeah. more, you know, more and more things can be classified as organic that, that maybe many folks wouldn't think, you know, in the spirit of the term should be. Um, yeah. All right. And then you said there are some private uh, organizations that are perhaps maybe coming up yeah. with better metrics or, or rhetorics that are true to the original spirit? Yeah, to the original spirit. They're actually looking at soil. They're actually looking at additional practices. Uh, one is a, a, an outfit called Beyond Organic. One is an outfit called Echo Eco Verified. That's being put forth by the Alan Savory Group. 
Uh, there's another one being put forth by Rodale Institute. I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head. But uh, there, there are numerous ones of these now, uh, and you will see more of them. And, of course, uh, you know, it's, it's <laughs> as if the consumer is not already um, assaulted by confusing uh-huh. labels. You know, now can you imagine, you know, the Beyond Organic folks, which probably have as much traction as anybody, um, they they are trying to create this as an add-on. In other words, you have to be government certified first, and then if you are, then you can go for the Beyond Organic. So here you have a label, you know, USDA certified organic, and then you have a Beyond Organic sticker on it, and... And, uh, you know, all of these outfits are going to be, we're, we're the true blue. You know, we're the, <laughs> it's like the Presbyterians, the Methodists, and the Baptists, you know. We're, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're the real, we're the real deal. And so, yeah, you're going to, you're going to see a lot of that. Now, now how to, how that plays out in the marketplace is going to be very interesting as you, as you have more and more, uh, whatever, uh, cacophony, railing, whatever going on in the, in the marketplace with all these, you know, espousing ours is the, ours is the real deal. We're the true blue. Um, uh, my hope is that it actually, it actually, whatever, irritates people to the point that they start looking local and start actually taking responsibility, uh, by, you know, by learning, uh, what their, what their food is, where it comes from. Um, and there, there are there are more and more uh, whatever tutorials now occurring uh, to teach consumers how to look at somebody's website, for example, and find out you know what they are. I mean, we have, for example, we have a, an outfit here in Virginia called Shenandoah Organics. Um, big money moved in, and they're they're uh, doing you know uh, hundreds of thousands of, of chickens, organic chickens, and they're just using you know defunct factory houses that are empty. The farmers aren't interested in organics. Uh, they just want their houses full of something. And you can go on their website, you know, meet our farmers. And uh, even though the organic standards require pastured, uh, you know, uh, chickens out on range and pasture, there's no chickens. There, there's no chickens on grass in, in the in the website pickers. They're all farmers standing outside their factory house holding an organic chicken. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, you you just have to have some savvy to. Um, to look through, so you you can punch through the clever speak and the pretty pictures and things on websites and really uh, find out what the what the real deal is. Of course, the best way is to come and visit farms. So we're hoping that that our what our friends, our tribe, who actually you know uh, have a, a I mean, we have a twenty four seven three sixty five open door policy. Anybody can come to the farm anytime to see anything anywhere. Uh, from anywhere in the world unannounced anytime um, that that will actually gain some traction you know, that that becomes a certification too you know that becomes uh customer verified right and and so um, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see how all these different different stories and different you know marketing sticks you know how they actually play out in the marketplace and what they actually do to you know, to uh, consumer awareness and and where it goes, it'll just be it'll just be really interesting. Yeah, and you know, I guess what I like about this is um, I don't like that it's just gets more and more confusing for the consumer who's trying to make you know a, a good decision um, for them and for their families. Um, but at the same time, one of the recommendations that you and, and many of the other um, uh, food security folks that we've been talking to over the years. Uh, you know, this just reinforces that recommendation, which is to buy local, you know, know your farmer, yep. buy local. Um, and, uh, you know, there are lots of good reasons to do before, but, but now because it sounds like it's getting harder and harder to trust the verification labels that, that we were using to make some of our decisions, you know, I think your, your point is this is just the right short, shortcut, which is, you know, don't go to the major grocery store. Yeah. You know, just go to the farmer's market or the local providers in your area yeah. and buy direct. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. And, and um, you know, uh, whatever, about five or six years ago, when, uh, when Walmart became the number one purveyor of organics in the country, we definitely saw a flattening out of 
um, you know, of farmers markets and direct farm marketing. And um, that is continuing. So my, um, you haven't asked for my, my second big take on what's happened in the last two years, <laughs> but, but my, but I'll go ahead and, and say it. My second uh, uh, big, big change that's happened in the food scene is, Amazon buying Whole Foods and door to door delivery. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're seeing now even, uh, you know, uh, brick and mortar stores, uh, having, you know, an express, a, a three parking spots, an express lane for people who order online and zip by and, and pick it up. Somebody runs their groceries out from the store. People, you know, too, uh, it's too inconvenient to even go inside. And, and this is actually, this is actually playing havoc with farms like us. Uh, you know, we're, we're struggling to stay, uh, current in our marketing, um, because, because this, this whole, um, convenience and availability is, you know, just, it's just really driving things. Um, I mean, we, just as a personal example, we we live ten miles from Stanton, which is a, a city of twenty thousand people. That's kind of our you know our, our shopping nexus where we go for things. And uh, we were running into numerous customers. I mean, we're, we're ten miles away, but we're on a dirt road, and we're running into people that you know I, I don't. I, I would never put my car on a dirt road. I would never you know come out there. Blah blah blah. If you'll if you'll bring it in here to town, and I'll I'll buy from you. Okay. <laughs> So, so we, we, we started this, um, you know, online buying club thing and, and you can order and we'll come in once a month and, and deliver it to you. And, um, and so once we did that, it, it didn't go anywhere. And what we started hearing was, well, why should I order from you when I can go through, you know, Amazon or somebody, uh, some, and, and you have it delivered on my door. Um, and, and they don't, they don't care that that's costing an extra 30, 40, 50 bucks, uh, of delivery. It's just the convenience, and so we we have just this whole um, you know convenience culture is is um, well it's, it's it's changing the marketplace, and um, I, I always say uh, you, you know it's okay to be nostalgic, you just have to quit being nostalgic one day before you're obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to put it. And, and so, you know, so that's the way, that's the way we feel. And so we're, we're actually, um, uh, you know, looking at, you know, delivery, distribution, whatever, uh, even using Amazon if necessary, um, because the, the push for door to door delivery is, um, is powerful. And, and the thing is, the big companies that are in distribution, I mean, for example, um, uh, FedEx, UPS, they actually have software where they plug in all the addresses they're going to go for the day, and the software routes them so they never have to make a left-hand turn. <laughs> and that, in and of itself, saves something like 30% of of the fuel costs and time, uh, of the, the delivery costs, on those companies. Um, now, that kind of software is extremely expensive. It's not available yet for small folks. You know, it's a, it's it's a it's a very um, you know complex, sophisticated algorithm that, that lets you do that. It's not available to us, and so um, so much of this convenience distribution, high tech orientation in the food marketing system uh, is. Is is uh, is prejudicial against smaller entities and concessionary toward large entities that can afford the cutting edge, you know, software to, you know, to efficiently do uh, to do the convenience. And so I'm, I'm not whining. I'm not complaining. I'm just this. This is a, this is a statement of fact. And so um, so we either have to figure out a way around it, or we have to educate our customers. Uh, to the point where they don't mind putting their car on a dirt road or, or a, a moment's inconvenience to, you know, to come and get something valuable, uh, or worthwhile. Or we, or we figure out a way to, like we've done with, you know, the internet and online sales so much, 
we figure out how to co-opt the technology that the big outfits have done and localize it for ourselves. Yeah. And I, I think that's I think that's where we're headed. Well, let me ask you this, Joel, because you guys are at Polyface are arguably the most famous sustainable farm in America, right? I mean, you, you guys have a lot of brand awareness um, and a lot of people who, uh, you know, uh, want to be supporters of yours because, you know, you've been one of the the message delivers to really break through into the right. mainstream. And, and, and I know we'd love to have many more people be aware of you than are today, but, but certainly they're much more aware of you than most other farms out there or, sure. or maybe arguably any other small farm. So what is this doing to the smaller players in your space? I mean, when you look at the other small farms, is, is this, is this at an Armageddon stage yet? Are these folks just falling off the wayside? Are they able to compete at all? Um, where, What's the rest of the pack doing right now? And, and, and by pack, I mean pack of small, yeah. sustainable farmers. Sure, sure, sure. Well, it, it, well, it's a great question. And, uh, and, and my sense is that, that they're, they're really struggling uh, because I hear from them, I meet them, I talk to them, and they are um, – they're, they're in triage. I, I don't know that it's Armageddon, but, but I think – I think in the, if, if the current, if the current trajectory continues unabated, um, I think we're going to, I think we are going to see some pretty significant, uh, changes, uh, in this. And, and, and frankly, as the baby boomers age and the millennials come on, I mean, the, the, the three things that define millennials are convenience. Mm -hmm. Community. Oh shoot, what's the other one? I can't think of it right now. But um, but but anyway, you know, in 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 another what is it like two years now? Actuarially, the millennials are going to have more. Um, they're going to become the bigger the bigger um, consumer population. Per, the bigger yeah, per, yeah. purchasing block. Right, right. Um, and and so the. So, so that is going to that's going to play a big role in how these things change. Um, we, you know, some of us. The, I'm older now, and you know, 30 or 40 years ago, when we were uh, forecasting what's going to happen in 30, 40 years this, with this, you know, this uh, integrity food movement, what's going to happen to it? And all of us thought, well, within 30 years, people would be back in their kitchens. They're going to be buying from their local, you know, from their neighbors. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have this, you know, renaissance of culinary community, uh, based. Right. Lots of victory uh, gardens. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, what has actually happened is the opposite. What we is an abandonment. Now, now there, there's still, you know, plenty of interest in that. But, but in, in the bigger scheme, when you take the aggregate, we've had an abandonment of that. And, um, and what's happened is more and more and more, uh, convenience. The, the single biggest growth, the only, the only real food sector that's growing right now is what's called the integrity convenience sector. Uh, around here at Polyface, uh, we, we joke, um, that what our customers really want are polyface hot pockets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so what we're seeing is, you know, power shakes, protein drinks, um, uh, snack, you know, uh, jerky meat snack sticks, dehydrated egg powder, you know, protein things, um, and and uh, protein bars. Uh, of course, you know, the whole CrossFit, um, paleo, keto. Uh, movement have have felt a that. lot of in yeah. yeah a lot of interest in this, um, but it's but but it's funny the paleo people they're not cooking you know <laughs> they're buying uh, protein drinks and jerky you know uh, and and so that forces but what that does is it forces the small farmer and, and we're we're right in the middle of this um, and, and we're not as small as many. 
but it forces the small farmer to either educate their customers and get them in the kitchen, which that's a really uphill battle right, right. now, or value add by, by making convenience food, heat, heat and eat, you know, uh, shelf stable convenience foods. Well, well, that sounds that sounds great. Uh, who doesn't want you know pasture based bologna or summer sausage or, or or you know jerky, whatever. The problem though is as soon as you go that route, then you're into the whole um, food safety regulatory structure, which is highly, 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 highly prejudicial uh, against small outfits. And and so, you know, the infrastructure requirements, the, um, you know, the HACCP plans, the hazardous analysis critical right. control point, uh, all of the compliance and licensing issues, um, you know, temperature readings, thermometer, you know, all of these things, the paperwork, uh, are just, are just horrendous for a for a small outfit that can't spread those costs over a tractor trailer load of stuff. You know, if, if you've got if you've got a a compliance uh, paperwork overhead to do, let's just say, uh, oh, let's just say uh, hot dogs uh, that that takes um, two hundred hours of manpower to, to fill out all the paperwork. And, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating here. I mean, this is, this is what this stuff takes. <laughs> um, 200 hours. Uh, that it's one thing to, to, to have that spread over a tractor trailer load of hot dogs a day coming out of a great big, you know, great big plant. Uh, it's quite another to have that spread out over you know, half a dozen little local artisanal guys that are producing, you know, 2,000 pounds a year. And, and that's why, that's why I have really come to the conclusion that any regulation that is, that is scale prejudicial is a bad regulation. Got it. Uh, yep. A, 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 reg, a regulation should not be discriminatory against smaller players and concessionary toward bigger players. Well, somebody might ask, well, well, na name me one that isn't. Well, a, a, a one that isn't is, for example, speed limits. It doesn't take any more effort or cost to put your foot on the brake of an 18-wheeler as it does a Toyota Prius. It, 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 it's, it's the same effort and the same cost of compliance. So that's an example of an okay regulation. But a not okay regulation is one in which the the cost of compliance is exactly the same for a five hundred million dollar business as it is for a five thousand dollar business. Right. That that is not a fair playing field. To say that that's a fair playing field, and that's what the other side says. Well, you know, we we, we make the rules. You you want to play the game, you got to make the rules. You got to you got to play. That's all fair. Well, uh, 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 an analogy would be okay. It would be as if um, you said, "Hey, you like football? You want to play football? Sure, you got to play football." But in, or in order to play football legally, you can only play football legally in a um, in an NFL stadium. Well, right. how many people would play football? Right. Right. It's not very and, many. And what does a stadium cost to build these days? You know, a right. billion dollars. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that that's that's an analogy, I think, that people can, especially when we're coming up to football season, right? Uh, <laughs> it's an analogy that people can understand. That it, it I mean, you, you could say, well, well, that that's a level playing field. The, you know, level play. The only way to play is you got to play in an NFL football stadium. Well, that's very level, but it certainly doesn't allow. For much participation in the, you know, in the in the marketplace, in the in the movement, and so um, so this this convenience this convenience food where the the local to be viable where the local producer, your neighborhood producer to stay viable is going to have to, you know, start making stews and quiche and <laughs> whatever. Um, uh, it creates an additional uh, hurdle in the marketplace due to 
the size discriminatory um, food safety cost of play. Yeah. So, um, a question for you on that then. So, uh, you've certainly identified that that's where the market is encouraging small providers to go. You've just said, you know, it, it may be cost prohibitive for most of them to get there. Um, do you do you see, you know, these small farms being able to to adapt here and to be able to somehow fill this need, or is or is this truly going to be prohibitive for them? Well, certainly, certainly some will, you know, will do fine, um, and 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 I truly hope that you know, the USDA actually now has a small a small value added um, uh, help desk helpline. I was just, I mean, I, I co-own a small, you know, community abattoir. Uh, we have, you know, what, 18 employees or something like that up in Harrisonburg. Um, and so I'm, I'm well aware of this, you know, prejudicial small plant regulatory structure. But, um, but there's actually a help desk now at the USDA that is actually, uh, quite helpful. So, uh, so, so th- there is definitely some movement. And the local food movement is definitely pushing back in this arena. So I don't want this to be a pessimistic uh, outlook here. I, I think I think we need to be realistic about where we are. But I think um, I think that if, if those of us that really care, um, uh, you know, push back and and stay whatever, stay strong, stay. Stay in the game here. Um, I think that pendulum is going to swing. I think it's going to swing our way. But, you know, most people are very concerned when, you know, Bayer buys Monsanto and Smithfield is sold to the Chinese. And, you know, these kinds of things, uh, you know, people don't talk much about it. But I can tell you down deep inside people, people are concerned about that kind of consolidation, that kind of thing. And uh, and I think I think that all those all those stories, all those occurrences in the big you know the big agribusiness orthodoxy community is every time that happens and hits the news, it creates another opportunity for an alternative narrative to be told, and that's mm-hmm. of course the the, lo- the local um, direct market story. Well, you know, I'm glad that you brought that up. I was going to ask about the Monsanto sale, um, but but maybe more at a higher level because I, I really like what you said about not trying to make this uh, uh, um, <laughs> you know, a despondent message that, that you, there's actually a lot of optimism here. Um, you know, you've been involved in the local food movement now for, for decades, um, and you've been, you know, one of, if not its loudest, uh, spokesperson. Um and you've, you know, done a wonderful job of raising awareness of a lot of the challenges that, that face small providers that are trying to do things, you know, better and, and more based on natural processes and things like that. Um, I know we're at cross currents here, both with what, you know, the, the, the big competition is doing, both on the regulatory side and with shifting consumer preferences, like you were just telling us about. Um, you know, at the same time, we've had the emergence of the farm-to-table movement. Um, there's definitely, I think, been a lot of progress over the past 10 years in terms of understanding nutrition science and, oh, and yeah. that, that healthy food, you know, is required for, for a healthy diet. Um, you know, net-net, at the end of the day, are, 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 are things getting better and are you optimistic about where momentum's going or... You know, is the empire striking back here and placing, you know, <laughs> regulations and, and competition and whatnot that's that's curtailing things? Like, wh- wh- where are you in terms of your morale around the the movement right now? Wow, uh, what a great question! I am not optimistic at all about where the where the the government, the bureaucracy is going, where the bureaucracy is headed. It, it is, it is getting more and more stifling. The Food Safety Modernization Act, FISMA, that Obama put through, um, it, it, it's just, um, it's absolutely stifling. And it's, it's, again, because it's size prejudicial, it is putting an inordinate, uh, price pressure on smaller producers. Uh, that's, that's a fact, uh, all the way across the board. And, and compliance you know the the cost of compliance is 
escalating the amount of paperwork, the amount of licensing, the amount of testing and, and procedural uh, stuff that, that's happening on on farms is is uh, well, it's, it's through the roof. So so uh, on the federal level, I think it's it's getting worse. Um, but I think what's happening on the local level, the other thing that the, the pushback that's happened is what's now known as the food sovereignty movement, and that started. In uh, I don't know what 2015 maybe uh, two or three years ago um, in Sedgwick, Maine, and that was a township that passed a half-page food sovereignty law that said um, in our township if a neighbor wants to do food commerce with another neighbor, it's none of the government's business and no bureaucrat has to be involved. So if you want to come to my house, look around, smell around, and and um, uh, operate as freedom of choice, as voluntary adults, as consenting adults, and I'm using very strong language here, mm-hmm. uh, a, 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 to to practice your freedom of choice, then two consenting adults should be able to engage in food commerce without a bureaucrat being involved. Well. Very quickly, six other townships in Maine took up the mantra and passed the regulation and the law as well. Um, then, of course, Maine pushed back and said, no, you can't do that. And it, it continued to build in Maine until finally the legislature and the governor passed it and said, okay, if a township wants to do that, it's okay with us. Well, then the USDA quickly responded and said, we're going to pull all of your federal inspected slaughterhouses and and food processing plants. Uh, Maine, you won't be able to sell to anybody because the federal government's pulling out if you do this. So this, then the governor called a uh, you know emergency session. They went back in, and uh, and it's still it's still being negotiated. It's a it's a big you know it's a big hoo ha, but uh, but that I don't want to belabor that. But but that food sovereignty movement, believe me, there are a lot of us around the country that are watching what's going on in Maine, and um, and we're very, you know, we're very interested in it. And if that if that were duplicated around the country, you know, it would almost be like uh, it would almost be like local food secession. Right. You know? um, and and I'm not a racist, but but there 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 is a place to say. At some level, we should be able to engage in food commerce at our own risk and our own uh, free will, and and that and that is definitely gaining momentum. Um, we see it in the expansion of the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, uh, which is Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund is a, essentially a Homeschool Legal Defense Association for um, for food, and uh, they now have in in two years they've gone from um, from collaborating attorneys in something like five states to collaborating attorneys in forty states. That's oh, no. phenomenal growth for a little nonprofit organization. Um, and so, as attorneys find out about how little farmers get treated by, you know, SWAT teams that come in and confiscate their food and, and, and different things like that. Uh, there's a, well, there, there's a, there's a backlash to it, you know, and, and, um, and now, you know, the beauty of the internet is that these things can be documented on iPhones. You, you know, people can see the, the bureaucrat, the SWAT teams coming in and throwing out the, free, the food, perfectly good food from a freezer. They can see people's the raid, they can see people's rights being violated, and um, and, and so uh, there is there is definitely a you know a, a backlash. It's it, it's it's a food freedom backlash in the country, and uh, I'm you know I've been an advocate of this all my life. Of course, yeah, you know, I've always said what, and, and I'm I'm a you know I'm a member of the NRA, so I you know I like guns. I'm not I'm not concerned about that. But I've always said, once when Americans become as interested in defending their right to acquire the food of their choice as they are the gun of their choice, we're going to have a whole different food 
paradigm in this country. Yeah. Uh, interesting. And so it does send them. I know you've always been more on the, you know, the, the bleeding edge of, uh, of tactics for uh, advocating for food freedom. Um, but it sounds like you're saying um, that you're, you have little to zero hope uh, with the government making things easier, you know, in the near term. Um, but you do have hope with this sort of guerrilla civilian yes. insurrection. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, rogue, rogue food is on the rise. Uh, <laughs> um, That's a great term. In, in, rogue fa- food. in fact, I, I would like to, I'd like to actually convene a, a national conference called you know the Rogue Food Conference because there are people here. Here's what's happening. There are actually people. There's there's one of the most successful ones in the country is in Louisville, Kentucky. It's a it's a food club that operates essentially under the same kind of a charter as a golf country club. It's not public. It's completely private. You can't, you know, if you don't, if you're not a member, you can't go play in that club or on that course. And so what this, what this is, is a, is a dues paying, non-public, members only food exchange, uh, um, model. And these guys in Louisville actually have a storefront. And they everything in there is illegal. I mean, they got everything from <laughs> raw milk to, to homemade pepperoni. I mean, it's all illegal, and nobody can touch them because it's a private club. Big, interesting. And, yeah, and so and so these things these things are beginning to pop up. There is more and more uh, interest in in exactly what you said. The gorilla just just circumventing the system. Um, to where many of us in this in this integrity food movement now say, you know, look, we've been trying to comply, 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 and there's there's a point at which circumvention is cheaper and less risky than compliance. Hmm. Interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, you know, when you when you push people beyond a certain line, you know, you've got little other better option than to, to try to break the rules. Yeah. Well, I mean, just think of, you know, um, Corey Ten Boom and, and the, you know, the, the, the cost, the cost of, of registration and compliance with what the government officials wanted got so high that circumvention, hiding, fleeing, you know, going underground. Mm-hmm. We're actually uh, better better options, and um, you know I, I don't want to sound like a you know a raving uh, whatever penny penny house is on fire, but but I, I can I, I I can tell you that the the pent up latent entrepreneurial desire for local food entrepreneurs in this country. I mean yes, they're farmers. They're entrepreneurs. Um, it's it's a very very powerful um, push, and of course, you know the only people that don't want it to proceed are of course the big the big food companies. The big entrenched interests, yeah. Yeah, sure. The the big entrenched interests that would find um, competition if we had a little more freedom. All right. Well, look, I want to start wrapping things up here only because I've already taken up so much of your time. And honestly, Joel, I could go on for hours for this. So we'll have to have you on again at some point if you're willing to come back. Sure. Um, but let's let's square what you've just said here. You know, there's a, a, a lot of, um, uh, you know, frustration. Uh, there's a lot of pent up desire to do things differently amongst, uh, you know, existing consumers. Uh, but then you also have this. What I believe, you know, from what I've been observing, although I don't have numbers at my fingertips, um, but there's a generational uh, wave going on right now where, you know, a lot of the millennial and younger generations, Gen Z, I guess, is the one behind the millennials. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, eschewment of the material career paths that previous generations took. And there's yeah. a strong, you know, respect for the environment 
and there's a sense of, you know, life, you want to live a fulfilling life, not necessarily just a financially wealthy life. And so, um, there's a real kind of, you know, back to the land and, um, you know, I think a strong, it, it, let me put it this way, a larger percent of this population uh, is interested in pursuing, you know, small-scale farming in many of the ways that you espouse yeah. uh, than was in previous generations. So, you know, how is that plugging into this kind of, you know, brewing revolution that you're talking about, just having this wave yeah. of bright, shiny people that really just want to do this for a living? Yes, I, I can tell you, I, I spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of time with millennials with our intern apprenticeship program, and I speak at college campuses uh, routinely, and I can tell you that, yes, it is heartwarming to meet uh, young people today who are more interested in doing something noble, righteous, and sacred than acquiring wealth, uh, material wealth, and that is an extremely hopeful sign. And for sure, what, what we are speaking about in, you know, nutritious soil building, um, land healing food is a pretty noble, uh, a noble calling. And, and that story is absolutely firing the imagination of a new generation of young people. And it's exciting to see, and I think that that wave is going to continue. Um, the old guard will not go down easily or gently. But, you know, there's a lot of tipping points that we're beginning to approach. I mean, I mean, the, the, the sheer, the fact that the U.S. now leads the world in the five non-infectious uh, morbidity diseases. Uh, you know, that's not the place to be number one. Right. Um, our, our, uh, the U U.S., U.S. sperm counts are down 60% in 30 years. In Africa, they're not down at all. Um, clearly something is different in the U.S. that sperm counts are that, you know, are that low. Um, we have, you know, we have desertification. Uh, we have water wars developing. Uh, you know, just, there are, there are lots of just very interesting, not to mention the whole, you know, the whole financial, you know, deficit spending type of tax type of thing. And so there are numerous tipping points that are showing themselves to us. And, um, and nobody, nobody knows what will be the trigger. But with as many looming as there are, uh, chances are that something will you know, will we'll trigger in the next, you know, 20 years that, that we're not really anticipating. I mean, this is the whole, this is the whole uh, deal of collapse, right? Right. You know, collapse is no civilization ever, um, rectifies its demise in time. Uh, the, the, nobody, you know, the guy who cut the last tree on Eastern Island, on Easter Island, um, was not thinking about where the next tree was going to come from. Right. And, and so, so, and, and I think in that regard, our civilization will not be any different than any other civilization in history. And the chances are, the thing that we fear the most right now probably won't be that trigger. It'll be, it'll be something maybe that we're not expecting. Mm -hmm. Oh, very true. And you know, it's exactly why peak prosperity exists because we're doing that on a, a number of levels you know what's going to yeah. <laughs> what, what's going to cause us to change your behavior in terms of our monetary policy or our credit binge or um our energy policy or you know the many ways in which we're depleting the environment and uh you know we talk about people two ways that humans change right one is by insight if i keep doing what i'm doing it's going to have a bad end then i should change my behavior or it's by pain. You keep doing what you're doing until it hurts too much to continue doing it. And sadly, human nature being what it is, and the behavioral economists have tons and tons of data supporting this, as a species, we tend to almost always change by pain. Um, so mm. it seems like it's probably going to go that way. And, and what is that, that trigger? What is what is going to yeah. be that one thing that's so painful enough that we change? You know, we at, at Peak Prosperity, we spend our time looking at the probabilities, but that's really the best we can do. And we're completely open to the fact that it'll probably be the bullet we don't see coming. 
Yeah. Well, because because prophecies tend to um, tend to rectify themselves. In other words, when when everybody starts saying we've got to, we've got to solve this problem here because it's a real problem, it becomes a self fulfilling uh, deal. All the all the effort goes into solving that problem, and that so that problem doesn't happen. It's the one you didn't see over here that's right. that's going to be the, you know, the one that's the problem. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm butchering it, but it's what is it? It's the uh, the Mark Twain quote. It says, uh, "It's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's yeah. the thing. Yeah. It's the thing that you think you know for sure that does." <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. All right. Well, Joel, again, thanks so much. Just in closing here, um, I just want to ask the general question of, you know, what's your advice to folks that are, you know, individuals listening to this podcast who, uh, you know, are inspired by your, your words and, and interested in, you know, affecting change in their local food systems? Um, is it getting involved in the integrity food movement? You know, we know for sure it's buying local. Um, what other things might you suggest for folks? Yeah, I, I kind of have a three-part uh, deal. One, one is um, get in your kitchen. The first thing is get in your kitchen. You, you can't, you can't be as profoundly divorced from your body's foundational um, fuel uh, and and expect integrity in the in the food system. So, so get in your kitchen. Unfortunately, we have so many techno gadgetized things in our kitchens now. Kitchens are fun, uh, as opposed <laughs> to maybe in great grandma's day. Uh, so, get in your kitchen. Um, number two, um, you know, go, go find a, find your, find your, your food treasures in your community. If you, if you're in a working, um, name relationship with your purveyors, uh, you will be the last one cut off. And, and I'm glad uh, you say that. I say the exact same thing and keep going. Yeah. So, um, developing that network and those relationships with your purveyors, um, you know, you'll get the last can on the shelf, which is a, a great place to be. Um, and then the third thing is do something, do something yourself. I, mean, I don't care whether it's a vermicomposting bin under the sink, a, a hanging, uh, you know, one of these uh, uh, PVC pot things that hangs from the patio and you grow all your own herbs in it or tomato plant or whatever, uh, you know, a beehive on the roof of the house. I mean, but do something yourself that, that plunges you into the awe and the mystery of life in a tactile, visceral way. And that will help you to realize there's a way bigger world out there than revolving around you. And I think that's a, that's a powerful thing to stimulate common sense and reason. You know, there's a, there, there's a reason why the urban sector votes as a block, very different than the rural sector. And I don't want to get partisan, but all I'm going to say is that that there is something about touching, smelling, sensually, tactically participating in growing things, in something that's growing in life uh, that that brings us to a humble place, which is the beginning of wisdom and common sense. I agree very much. I think those are wide words. And the only thing I'd add is, is you know, not only do you become aware of that world, but you be, you develop an appreciation that it's a world worth fighting for, which is exactly what you were saying. Is is yeah. you know part of the hope in the story. It's it's yeah. uh, the public really stepping up to take back control of uh, the things it values. Great. All right, Joel. Well, thank you so much, um, folks. Uh, Joel Salatin. You can uh, read more about Joel. Uh, see what he's up to at uh, his farm at Polyface Farm. It's PolyfaceFarm dot com or Polyface dot com. Yeah. Poly Polyface Farms. Polyface Farms dot com, and I have a have a blog, the musings the uh, musings from the lunatic farmer, and. Uh, so they can keep up with me there as well. Great. We'll link to that. And Joel, you've written a whole slew of books. What's your most recent one? The most recent one is um, Your Successful Farm Business. Great. Super timely topic. Um, I'll link to that as well here in the podcast write-up. Um, all right, everybody else, Joel Salatin. Hopefully we'll have him back on soon again. And uh, Joel, again, thank you so much for your time today. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. Chris Martinson from Peak Prosperity here with David Stockman. Hi, David. Uh, Chris, great to be with you. I look forward to the conference. Absolutely. Well, I'm here to let everybody know that we are going to be delivering a special summit in New York City on Sunday, September 16th, 2018. That's from 10 a.m. in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. David, what kind of things are you going to be talking about and presenting? Well, my focus is going to be on the end of bubble of the bubble finance era, uh, driven by an extraordinary uh, central bank expansion that uh, was just off the charts of anything that had happened uh, previously in history or even had been contemplated. And, of course, that led to huge bubbles in all the financial markets of the world, a tremendous inflation of financial assets. All of that seemed to create the appearance of prosperity. I think it was fake. I think it was unsustainable. Mm -hmm. And now we have the Fed finally recognizing that it has to pivot to QT and move to shrink its balance sheet and normalize uh, you know, monetary policy and interest rates, and that's going to change everything as we go forward. Absolutely. And David, to that, I'm going to dovetail in. I'm going to be focusing on energy, specifically oil, which many more analysts are now coming around to my view saying, hey, it could go to 100, maybe 200 a barrel based on structural investment shortfalls that already happened. So I'm going to be discussing that and what that will mean to this late stage credit cycle you're talking about in this world of inflated asset bubbles as well. I have some economic data I like. I'd love to get your views on that as we riff on that and the environment too. So I think we have to bring the the ecological world in. And of course... You, the audience, will have the chance to both listen to the timely, actionable information of David Stockman and myself, as Adam Taggart's going to be there as well. Ask all three of us any questions you may have for more information and to register. Please go to peakprosperity.com slash NYC. Again, that's peakprosperity.com slash NYC. See you there.